Hello listeners. Welcome to Itihasa, a Indic history podcast. And you're listening to episode 23 of the season Vijayanagara. In the last episode, we looked at the little known battle of Raichur that took place in 1520 AD, waged between Sri Krishna Devaraya of Vijayanagara and Sultan Ismail Adil Shah of Bijapur. This epic battle saw a number of firsts in the Indian subcontinent. the earliest significant appearance of cannon whether used offensively as field artillery or used defensively on the fort walls the earliest known appearance of matchlock firearms and the first significant use of european mercenaries it followed the fusion of new gunpowder and firearm technologies developed by the german bohemian portuguese and deccan gunsmiths we saw how for several centuries before 1520 AD the bahmani sultans to the north of the raichur duab and the emperors of vijayanagara to the south had repeatedly fought over access to the duab's economic resources control of the fortified city of raichur figured in all of these struggles in this episode we will see how the battle of raichur was also a prelude to the more famous and epic battle of tallikota which took place 45 years after this battle a battle that permanently altered the geopolitical map of the deccan in the south the resounding success against adil shah in raichur conflict also had far reaching impact even in the psychological aspects of both the empires let's pick up the story where we left in the last episode with the battle concluded and a decisive victory in hand Before returning to Hampi, Krishna Devaraya lingered in Raichur for some days, making arrangements for the city's new administration. And he followed it up with renovations to the damaged fort walls and commissioning new architectural additions to the Raichur fort in the form of a new city gate and an elaborate courtyard with beautiful murals from Ramayana and Mahabharata engraved on them. Following Krishna Devaraya's return to Vijayanagara and the round of festivities that celebrated the emperor's victories at Raichur a Adil Shahi ambassador arrived in the capital to negotiate a final settlement between the two adversaries After keeping him waiting for a month the emperor finally admitted the ambassador for a private audience The latter conveyed an extraordinary request from Ismail Adil Shah namely that Krishna Devaraya should restore the city of Raichur to Bijapur together with the artillery tents horses and elephants that the Bijapuris had lost in the battle and in return Ismail Adil Shah would remain the king's enduring and loyal friend in response Krishna Devaraya agreed to grant all these requests and even to return Bijapur's highest ranking officer Salabat Khan who had been captured in the debacle by the Krishna river on the sole condition that Ismail Adil Shah first come down to the Vijayanagara and kiss his foot when this response was conveyed to the Bijapur sultan the latter replied through his ambassador that whereas he was of full mind joyfully to do that which the king wished it was unfortunately not possible for him to legally enter another king's sovereign territory by responding in a witty way like this the sultan wanted to politely deflect the highly insulting condition of krishna devaraya one must really commend ismail's attempt to get out of this bind if he had agreed to such an atrocious demand he would have lost all respect and prestige instantly in the eyes of his own people and other deccan sultans and undoubtedly he would have become a laughing stock in the entire subcontinent too if he had directly refused the condition in a fit of anger which would have been wholly justified and warranted the negotiations would have collapsed at the risk of further angering krishna devaraya who wasn't known to take an insult lightly On hearing the diplomatic and witty deflection of the sultan Krishna Devaraya 
offer to accommodate the sultan's concerns by meeting him at their common border near the fort of mudgal there the sultan could kiss the emperor's foot so krishna dev raya without waiting for the sultan's response he proceeded north to the fort of mudgal accompanied by a formidable army to make sure he had the sultan's undivided attention but ismail adil shah who had no intention of going to mudgal or of ever enduring the humiliation of kissing the emperor's foot stalled and delayed while his messengers notified the king that he was on the way and would reach the fort very soon however when it became clear that ismail wasn't going to present himself at the border the emperor opted for an alternative course of action which was intended to be even wittier than ismail's responses and even more humiliating krishna dev raya chose to bring his foot to the sultan in person so that he could kiss it in his own domain without having to travel anywhere the emperor and the vijayanagar army then entered adil shahi territory moving as far north as the capital of bijapur which the sultan had wisely vacated before krishna dev raya's arrival with ismail absconding krishna dev raya's men proceeded to damage several of the city's prominent houses on a cooked up reason that they needed firewood when the sultan through his own voice protested this reckless behavior krishna dev raya replied that he was unable to restrain his men from their actions which was a, of course a lie meanwhile the sultan preferring to suffer the humiliation of his capital desecration than to kiss the emperor's foot simply avoided his capital as long as krishna dev raya was in the city eventually the emperor having made his point returned to his own capital hampi and finally with the great raya returning to his capital after heaping insults on the adil shah this whole unsavory and dramatic affair in the aftermath of the battle came to a conclusion and it left a bitter taste in adil shah's mouth especially richard a meeton has something really interesting to say in his analysis on this whole kiss my foot affair let's look at his analysis in detail let's look at the excerpt it's a pretty long one but it's interesting quote two observations emerge from this discussion first nunez's account of krishna dev raya's overwearing behavior in the aftermath of the raichur battle stands at odds with his image in modern scholarship which tends to revere him as an ideal indian monarch heroic virtuous pious and just modern scholars have even dignified him with the name krishna dev raya even though contemporary sources generally refer to him simply as krishna raya one 20th century scholar rejects outright the possibility that notwithstanding nunez's testimony a man as noble hearted as krishna raya could have demanded that an adversary kiss his foot but we need to evaluate the man by accounts of his own day one might expect that court poets or chroniclers who had a professional investment in glorifying the court they served would celebrate not suppress the episodes in which their royal patron crushed or humiliated their enemies but unfortunately no contemporary poetry concerning krishna raya's raichur campaign survives the sole evidence in the matter comes from an outsider farnao nunez who had spent 3 years in metropolitan vijayanagara not as an ambassador but as a horse trader who would have been in touch with the court's commercial agents as such he would not seem to have had any motive either to celebrate or to criticize the king besides balancing the chronicler's matter of fact account respecting krishna raya's foot there is several references to the king's generosity 
such as the latter's generous treatment of Raichur's defeated townspeople. In the final analysis, Nunez's account of the episode respecting Krishna Raya's foot serves to humanize the man and as such can perhaps provide a much needed corrective to the king's idealized cardboard cutout image found in most textbooks. Unquote. That was one of the longest excerpts we heard on the show. But it's really an interesting one. I wanted to read that out so people can actually figure it out or try to decipher it on their own what it actually means. But here is my opinion. So I can indeed see myself agreeing with Eaton's assessment of Krishna Devaraya's haughty behavior against his defeated opponent. The level of insults heaped by him against Ismail Adil Shah could have been certainly avoided and could have been graceful instead. Eaton's assertion that Krishna Devaraya has been idealized ad nauseum and that this incident brings him down from the pedestal which people and historians over ages have put him on isn't entirely accurate. He misses the cultural nuance aspect here as is solely looking at the documented contemporary evidence and obviously won't have the consciousness that was passed through the generations through word of mouth. While it is indeed true that people even to this day admire and have immense respect for Krishna Devaraya, it's important to mention that they are also aware of his flaws. And most don't really consider him as the Uttama Purusha, like Lord Rama. Even as a child, I remember hearing and reading stories and watching movies of Sri Krishna Devaraya in which his flaws like short temper, pride and occasional haughtiness have been portrayed well and contrasted against his love for the welfare of his empire, people, courage and ensuring justice across the empire. Anyone who has read the Tenali Ramakrishna stories will realize what I am talking about. He was idealized and loved in spite of all of his flaws, not due to lack of them. Having said that, one can empathize with the cultural handicap some of the foreign researchers like Richard Amaton are at times afflicted with, whether it is willful or inadvertent, you know, when it comes to India, because they tend to get reductionist in their analysis most of the times. But the second observation when it comes to Krishna Devaraya's conduct in the aftermath of the Raichur battle is far more serious. He suddenly adopts a gunboat style diplomacy instead of his usual mellow and generous style, which he had shown during his Orissa campaign against the Gajapatis prior to the Raichur campaign. Let's look at an excerpt from K. A. Nilakanta Shastri's work, The History of South India, on this matter. Quote, The machinations of one Asad Khan Lari, a wily courtier of Ismail Shah, who had been sent to Vijayanagara to conclude a treaty, led Krishnadevaraya into yet another campaign against Bijapur in 1523. According to Asad Khan's undertaking, the Adil Shah or his mother would meet Krishna Deva at a certain point on the northern frontier of the kingdom. As he did not find them, however, he marched on Gulbarga by way of teaching them a lesson and raised its fortress to the ground. He also captured the fortress cities of Firuzabad and Sagar and led his army up to Bijapur, which for a time he occupied and left sadly injured. At Gulbarga, he liberated the three sons of Mahmud to Bahmani, made the eldest of them Sultan and brought the other two with him to Vijayanagar and treated them with much consideration. But this attempt to resuscitate Bahmani sovereignty under Hindu patronage lacked all possibility of success and perhaps only served to irritate the more the sultans of the five succession states." Unquote. Interestingly, it was this sudden change in Krishnadevaraya's style of diplomacy 
which inadvertently carried the seeds for the destruction of Vijayanagara. As fate would have it, during Krishna Dev Raya's campaigns against the Bijapur Sultanate, he had in his army a young and dynamic man who was of exceptional ability and talents. This man's military, political and administrative talents catch the eye of the emperor, who is thoroughly impressed by them. So, Krishna Dev Raya gives his own daughter, the royal princess, in marriage to this young army officer and makes him a royalty. And this man was Aliya Ramaraya, our tragic hero with whom we began this season. We know how after Krishna Deva Raya's death in 1529 AD, Aliya Ramaraya steadily rose in power by 1542 AD, becoming Vijayanagara's supreme regent. ruling the empire through a nephew of Krishna Deva Raya whom he had reduced to a status of puppet emperor the aftermath of raichur battle and krishna deva raya's style of high handed diplomacy leaves a strong impression on rama raya he takes inspiration from it unfortunately and uses it as a club against the enemies and allies of vijayanagara For several decades, Ramaraya cynically intervened in conflicts among the Deccan Sultanates as we saw before in the earlier episodes. Ramaraya's manipulative and haughty behavior finally induces those same Deccan Sultanates in 1565 AD to combine forces and crush him and his army in the Battle of Tallikota. As we already saw in the third episode of the season, the immediate cause of the battle of Tallikota lay in an act that in its brazen audacity accorded that of Krishna Deva Raya and his foot. In 1562 AD, if you remember from the past episodes, Rama Raya had demanded that if his adversary Sultan Hussein Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar were to enjoy lasting peace with Vijayanagara, he must first come and eat a paan, which was a beetle nut leaf, from Rama Raya's own hand. Unlike Ismail Adil Shah, who simply vacated his capital to avoid kissing Krishna Deva Raya's foot, Sultan Hussain Nizam Shah succumbed to Rama Raya's humiliating demands and eats the beetle nut leaf from Aliya Rama Raya's hands. So determined to avenge this act or this humiliation Nizam Shah took the lead in organizing a coalition of Deccan sultanates to wage the campaign in which Rama Raya was killed his army significantly damaged and the city of Hampi destroyed It's indeed ironic that the very two men Sri Krishna Dev Raya and his son-in-law Aliya Rama Raya who took the empire to its peak and heights of glory ended up being the same people who were the ultimate cause of its decline and destruction while this diplomatic and psychological analysis explains to an extent the aftermath of the battle of raichur it still doesn't explain how a decisively defeated bijapur and raichur was able to recover and ultimately vanquish a much powerful foe like Vijayanagara 45 years later at Tallikota. You see, the result at Tallikota wasn't a fluke event. And what happened at Raichur had a direct bearing on this battle later. Bijapur had made a splash at Raichur in 1520 AD. But the ripple of it was observed at Tallikota. and it's important to understand the what and how of it Richard M Eaton in his book Power Memory and Architecture published in 2016 offers an interesting analysis on this which we will now look at The most important thing that happened in the years following the decisive battle of Raichur was the opposite conclusions drawn by Vijayanagara and Bijapur from the outcome of the battle The losing Bijapuris understood that 
despite the advances in Canon technology already made in their Goa arsenal, they had much to learn about the deployment of field cannons. They would need considerable practice before this new technology could become truly lethal to opponents who had mastered the tactics and techniques of cavalry warfare. Similarly, at Raichur, the military engineers conservative approach to mounting cannons on the fort's ramparts proved their own undoing. As we saw in the previous episode, the arrangement of the fort's defenses, the Raichur forts, with 30 stone hurling catapults placed on the bastions and several hundred heavy and light cannons fixed along the curtain walls in a static position, each shot fired by those cannons would tend to land in nearly the same predictable spot in front of the fort. As a result of this, Krishna Devaraya soldiers were able to dismantle a portion of the city's walls without suffering high casualty rates because they were able to avoid the cannon balls which were falling in a predictable space. In short, Bijapur's forces at Raichur fort deployed the new gunpowder technology in a manner that proved just as disastrous there as did the deployment of cannons in the pitched battle by the Krishna river so in short basically the way they deployed these cannons either on the fort walls of raichur fort or in the battle that was fought between both these kingdoms near the krishna river were really bad so it wasn't that the technology was bad it was the application of the technology which was flawed yet crucially Bijapur's military and political rulers chose not to abandon the new artillery technology that had so decisively failed them at Raichur. To the contrary, they and their engineers would mount an accelerated drive to master the use of cannons, both defensively and offensively. It is often the case that empires or nations assimilate new technologies by a gradual process of trial and error in respect of which failures can be as important as successes and it is exactly this that happened at bijapur meanwhile krishna devaraya though evidently he was impressed with the effectiveness of the matchlocks used by his portuguese mercenaries he failed to see cannon warfare as the wave of the future prevailing against Bijapur's artillery both in pitched battle and at the fort seems to have reconfirmed the emperor's confidence or should i say overconfidence in the efficacy of the day's conventional warfare which was just infantry and you know cavalry attacks and it's not surprising that we find no evidence that he he as in krishna devaraya followed up his victories by establishing an arsenal or matchlock foundry in his kingdom so basically vijayanagara didn't focus or find it important to develop these a uh, new artillery technologies or the firearm technologies and not did krishna devaraya successors even mount cannons on the walls of vijayanagara's capital hampi or in other ways adapt their defensive systems so as to integrate gunpowder technology i had spoken about this weakness in detail in the second episode and told you how it made it easy for the deccan alliance to march upon the capital of hampi on a post after the debacle at tallikota so for the rest of its existence after the battle of raichur vijayanagara and its successive rulers simply failed to take gunpowder technology very seriously whereas defeated raichur would catalyze bijapur sultanate to embark on a remarkable drive for a military modernization and on the other hand his overconfidence and the thumping victory at raichur lulled krishna dev raya and his successors into a state of relative complacency a blunder for which vijayanagara would pay later a very heavy price in short the legendary and beloved shri krishna devaraya lacked the crucial foresight and vision when it came to anticipate the rapid developments in military technology that were to happen 
and failed to see which way the wind was blowing which then prevented him from realizing that it was highly imperative for Vijayanagara to join the arms race in the Indian subcontinent so in this aspect one must really commend the decisively beaten Bijapuri sultan for not giving up on gunpowder technology and objectively analyzing his army's strengths and weaknesses to fight and win in the long run Bijapur's military engineers also appear to have closely studied the reasons for the devastating defeat at Raichur because in the course of next 40 years they came up with a series of technological solutions that were both creative and far reaching and this, this was in the domain of cannons and firearms and this uh, far reaching impact or investments into technology from a military standpoint pays off handsomely during the battle of Tallikota where Ramaraya's forces are decimated by the artillery and super cannons of the Deccan Sultanate alliance especially Bijapur from a military standpoint the battle of Raichur represents what might appear a paradox because the side that relied the more extensively on firearms not only lost but lost decisively In April of 1526 that is just 6 years after the battle of Raichur one of the most famous battles of Indian history was fought at Panipat more than 1000 miles north of Raichur Doab in that battle the central asian turkish prince babur deployed field cannon in defeating the last ruler of the delhi sultanate which led directly to the establishment of the mughal empire given the significance of the battle's outcome and the fact that the winning side used cannon panipat is sometimes seen as having inaugurated india's gunpowder age coming back to raichur so the city of raichur remained under vijayanagara's control for only 10 years until 1530 when Ismail Adil Shah reconquered the fort following Krishna Deva Raya's death in 1529 AD but during the decade from 1520 to 1530 Vijayanagara's governors architects and engineers reshaped the city's physical appearance in ways that would assert the aesthetic vision of Vijayanagara From epigraphical evidence we know that in July 1521 about a year after the city's transfer to Vijayanagara a patron named Kantamaraju Sri Rangaraju dedicated a new temple in the city Unfortunately the structure is not identifiable now However the many structural additions or modifications and the new gates and the city outer walls that were built by Vijayanagara rulers are basically still visible and the, the distinct vijayanagara features are pretty much clearly there for to see on the fort's northern side especially the exterior courses of several bastions like i said earlier are covered with some sculptural reliefs and murals you know which are identical to the 16th century metropolitan of vijayanagara The Naurangi Darwaza built by Krishna Dev Raya is one such example. So overall the Raichur fort is a classic example or a site you know which basically showcases different architectural and aesthetic traditions the Bahmani and the Vijayanagara which are very much juxtaposed one beside the other. It shows the intense rivalry that Bahmanis and Vijayanagara had at that time. With this we will end this episode and also the mini series on the battle of Raichur. I sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed the Raichur series. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you are listening to. A huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. I hope to see you soon in the next episode in which we will explore the other aspects of Vijayanagara. Till then this is Narendra Vikram your host and narrator signing off hope you have a great week ahead